Hello and welcome to the special holiday edition of the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. A week ago, we asked listeners to send us their questions that maybe they've had all year that they haven't had the opportunity to ask us. And we decided to devote this entire podcast today to answering those listener questions. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you can see that this is a special festive edition of the 538 Politics Podcast. We have cookies and You get a cookie if you're watching on YouTube. (laughs) Indeed. So anyway, I'm wearing personally holiday lights. I'm dressed up like a Christmas tree. I'm dressed Um, up like a (laughs) grown-up. And Micah has a menorah (laughs) sitting next to him. We also have Um, a snow globe. When I came, the menorah was right in front of my seat, which I felt a little targeted, but... We wanted to make sure you knew where to sit. Yeah. Anyway, as you can tell, here with me are senior politics writer Claire Malone. Hi, Galen. Happy holidays. And managing editor Micah Cohen. How are you? Very good. Our holiday decorations consist of Christmas, Hanukkah decorations, and then just random accoutrement. We even have a nativity scene with uh, Draymond as baby Jesus. Seems a little sacrilegious, but let's roll with it. All right, so let's get started. And we have a whole pot of questions uh, to answer. First one to Claire. First one goes to Claire. And this is from Max Child. Oh, interesting. The question is, how many times does the average 538 reader refresh the general election model webpage in the months leading up to November? Max, how the f*** should I know? <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have to throw this one to our managing editor, Micah Cohen. Holiday spirit from Claire. Um, so actually, I asked Stephanie Roos, who... Uh, Did you prepare for this? I saw that question. Okay. Um, <laughs> cheater. <laughs> and I asked Stephanie Roos, who kind of runs 538, really, but the, the, the business and audience That's side true. of 538. Um, and she told me that we cannot share audience data publicly. Wait, seriously? Mm-hmm. That sounds it's a, right. It's a company-wide rule. What I will say is the average reader visits our forecast a ton of times in the lead-up to an election, like repeatedly. You, you guys should also read our articles, not just the model. But you should definitely refresh the model. Articles. Yeah. Is it correct, and I'm pretty sure this is public, that in 2016 the presidential model was the most trafficked piece of web page on the Internet? According to Chartbeat, yes. It was the number one piece of, of web content. On the internet in 2016. Wow, you guys are wild. Okay. (laughs) On to our next question. The answer is a lot. A lot. Um, All right. I will say, like, going to social occasions after the 2016 election made me think that a lot of people were refreshing it. It's hundreds and hundreds of millions, yeah. Since we're in the holiday spirit and drinking eggnog, I will say that for two years after the 2016 election, the first question I got on almost every date was, why did you get the 2016 election wrong? On every date? On every date. That's a red flag right there. Yeah, I know. All right. (laughs) Our next question is from Ian McLaughlin with an Irish flag next to his name. So, here we go. So it's probably for you, Claire. (laughs) No, but if it's like a, if he's pronouncing it like a Gaelic way, it's probably like, (laughs) Yeah, Now that we've offended all of our Irish (laughs) listeners, the question is, what unique obstacles do candidates of color face in media coverage How has 538 played into those blind spots, and how can these problems be mitigated in the future? Diving into the serious questions here. I mean, I think um, probably first and foremost, it's like a novelty thing, right? There's always, for a candidate of color on a national level, probably this certain sense of, um, oh, how did this person, like, how does it feel to be, you know, the first fill in the blank, whatever it is. And Kamala Harris actually I I thought was really interesting when she talked about this because she was so, um, to me, obviously really resistant to that framing. You know, what is it like to be the, what was it like to be the first woman? What was it like to be the first black woman kind of thing? And she always kind of pushed back a little in in this irritating way of like, well, I'm, you know, qualified to do the job. So I think there's that, there's a novelty thing. This election cycle, I think it's also been for, Um, the black candidates in particular, the specter of Barack Obama, right? And people saying, well, why can't these black candidates win the black vote? Um, And that's a complicated question. And I think a lot of black leaders or just black voters would say, well, we don't have to vote for the black guy. We We also already had the first black president. So it's kind of balancing the idea of what it's like to sort of watch the, the, um, monopoly of like white men in power and politics break down without kind of, 
um, infantilizing or trivial, trivializing the accomplishments of candidates of color. And then I also think the separate, and I'll stop monologuing, um, you know, Julian Castro, when Kamala Harris got out of the race, said, well, there was a double standard for her. The media treated her differently. I think he kind of meant color and her gender. Um, and I don't know if I agree with that one so much. I think cer she certainly got a little more, like, electability coverage. But she also, as, as we've talked about, was kind of over covered in some ways. Yeah, um, this is a tough one. And, and we could spend an hour and a half talking about it. Um, the, th the only thing I guess I would say is th what Claire was saying, that, that many candidates of color are covered first as a candidate of color um, as opposed to just a candidate um, is just a difference that it's hard to describe how that changes the race. Um, if Cory Booker were white, would he be performing differently in the polls? I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, for 538, for us, you know, I think we are, we are a mostly white newsroom and we're obviously have been and are continuing to work to diversify as a newsroom in a lot of different ways, but that can't help but um, influence the way we, we cover a campaign. For sure. Um, we are definitely a majority white newsroom. I do just want to also take a moment at the end of the year to say that um, a lot of the people who you don't necessarily see bylines of yeah. in our newsroom are women or people of color. Well, you know, it is still majority white. And of course, many a, newsrooms around America, 70, right? 70% of America, I just, I wrote a story which included this stat recently. It's like American newsrooms are about 70% white in general. So it's like an incredibly yeah. white And there industry. are specific, by the way, voters are not exempt from this either, right? Voters, I think, have some of the same biases that you see reflected in, in media coverage. But to take one example we've talked about, candidates of color and women actually are covered as more liberal and perceived as more liberal than they actually are because of um, race or because of gender. There are a whole host of other sort of very tangible things like that that, uh, that affect the race. It's also worth noting as people are going to be listening to this less than two months out from the Iowa caucus, that part of the design that, part of the design of the primary that is up to the parties to create, and also how the media covers it plays a big role as well, is the fact that Iowa and New Hampshire are very white states, and so off the bat, when the media yeah. covers them obsessively, they're giving a lot of emphasis to the voices of white voters, and they're not covering as obsessively voters in Nevada and South Carolina, and that's just, that's how the system works, that it's part up to the parties and it's part up to the media for kind of setting that stage the way that it does. Yeah, and we also, I mean, just one last thing is like, I think we've done a good job or a better job of the last election maybe of talking about electability and what that's a euphemism for, but we also still talk about electability, right? Like we are like the rest of the media in that we discuss it and that is obviously, that contains a lot of stuff inside of it. We have been good in including Perry Perry's writing, stuff, writing yeah. about the problems inherent in yes, electability. For sure. yeah. All right, next up, we have Je Fouad, or J-E-F-O-I-D. I don't know what that, but <laughs> it's from Je Twitter. Fouad. Je Fouad. That's good. Is the general industry of polling getting more or less healthy over time? I feel like the death of the landline is a huge problem, but maybe not, question mark? Let's go to Nate on that one. Nate's actually working on the model as we speak, which is why he's not here. <laughs> I should have mentioned that. No Nate. Um, I think that the polling industry, I'll take this one, Claire. Okay, um, thanks. I think that the polling industry... <laughs> I'll take the eggnog. <laughs> by the way, it's hard to talk af after drinking eggnog, as you warned me, Galen. Um, I think that the polling industry is getting healthier. Um, the, it's ooh, not drinking I'll eggnog. <laughs> the, the, the landline thing is a real problem. Um, there are other problems, but there, it, it's become cheaper to conduct a poll. So the barrier to entry has been lowered. Now, it's cheap to conduct a cheap poll, right? It yeah. still costs money to conduct a really high quality poll. But because the barrier to entry has been lowered, a lot of new people are getting in, experimenting with stuff. Long term, I think it'll be good for polling. All right. Next up, the question is, who would win the Democratic primary if ranked choice voting was used in all <laughs> states? What is this, my sophomore year political science class? Yeah, this is. <laughs> I think it was relatively easy to answer. Do you? Why don't yeah. you take the question? Yeah, go ahead, Galen. 
If you look at The Economist polling and you ask who voters are considering broadly, you see that 50% of voters are considering Joe Biden, 50% of voters are considering Elizabeth Warren, then it drops off significantly, 39% are considering Sanders, 35% Buttigieg. And so that's the number you're looking for when you're talking about ranked choice voting. What's the common denominator amongst all the voters? And it's either Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden. Now, I couldn't tell you between those two who would actually win if they were doing ranked choice voting. So you're not actually like, answering the question. But it seems like <laughs> it would think, be one of those two. I think generally that's right. What I wonder a little bit about is if you're adding the complication of ranked choice voting, that's another layer of complexity on top of the existing complexity of the sequencing of the primary. That's what I think is hard. Yeah. So I don't know how. So what yep. you'd have to figure out is how does ranked choice voting affect Iowa and therefore how does it affect New Hampshire and so on? Yeah, maybe still the same effect, but you know. I heard another interesting idea. We put a call out to listeners a while back for a project that we're working on that's going to come out in the new year about how the primary system works. And one idea was ranked choice voting across time. So if you vote for somebody in Iowa who then drops out, your second choice vote gets added to people who are still in the race. We've got some very nerdy listeners with complicated ideas for how to administer how does, elections. Yeah, how, does that, how is that administered given that we have um, each state, each district is in charge of their own elections? There's no, there's no like um, standardized election system. It would mean the party stepping in and saying this is how, because it's not up to the federal government how primaries are run. So it would mean the parties say, we don't like how the system is working. We want to overhaul it. Party, state parties, you've got to do it this way. Listeners, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next question is from Marcy. And the question is, has anyone ever published a quantitative measurement of how political opinions differ between those who are, quote, very online and those who aren't? I don't know. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, Nothing jumps to the top of my head. There's stuff about how people get their news, and yes. that's certainly um, Pew Research does does stuff about um, the demographics of people get their their news. Uh, people who get their news primarily from TV, primarily from print, primarily from digital. I believe now, over the past couple of years, Americans overwhelmingly get their news online. Yes, but I, I don't. But I don't know about the. I don't. I, I can't off the top of my head think of a thing where it it parses out. Well, I think actually you probably don't need to, you, it, it's probably a proxy generally for just age um, is my guess. The Pew, the Pew research though might, maybe it does it by party. Yeah. No, but I guess my point is, I think yeah. on, to the extent to which you are online it probably breaks down largely along age lines. So if you wanted to know the opinions of the population that is disproportionately not online, you could probably just look at polling results among voters. Have you ever been on Facebook, Micah? Because boomers are really running the town on Facebook. I think every, yeah. you know, even among uh, older age brackets, yeah. th most people are online or some percentage of people yeah. are online, but it probably Didn't the off. New York Times do something looking at the opinions of people who use Twitter often versus the rest of the country? I'm pretty sure they did. It was one of those who pieces are on that Twitter. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quote, and I don't like know what quote Democrats very online on means. Yeah. It was the Democrats online thing. Yeah. yeah. So there is, go look at the New York Times. They've, they've done a little research. Yeah, I mean, online or in print, though? Well, <laughs> Twitter, is, Twitter is an even higher or narrower definition of online than just online. And what like, does very online mean? Probably Twitter. They probably yeah, I think, like, I think if you're very online, you know. Go to that New York Times thing. That's a good suggestion. Very online is, is Twitter, but that's what, like 8% of the country? I don't know. I don't even know. Hopefully not even that much. All right, next question. Shots fired at Twitter, jeez. Um, Weston asks, oh, there's both a serious and a silly question included in this. Serious that's question. Serious wow, West, Weston contains multitudes. Endorsements don't sway voters, so why slash how do they actually change primaries? Uh, actually, Weston, I would uh, dispute the premise of your question. Um, well, actually... <laughs> that was my Nate impersonation. Um, I don't think we know that endorsements don't sway voters. Certainly voters aren't marching in lockstep behind, you know, endorsers, like what their local representative does. 
But in the aggregate, um, maybe they sway. Yeah. They affect media coverage like in their I, first, you know. Like AOC's endorsement, right? Like we talked about that. That was a big thing. I mean, it, and it kind of came on the heels of the Sanders heart attack and I think kind of injected some like oomph to the campaign. Um, I don't know. It's also, especially in Iowa, like going back to like early states, I think where you kind of are really relying on like retail campaigning yeah. and um, okay, you're going to host a house party here, and then you're going to get a bunch of people to sign up. And, and it's when it rely, when an election relies on follow up and like na like recognizing that person, that local person who's advocating for that particular candidate. I think it does matter. No, so that's a thing. That's a really good point. It's like okay, so you have kind of the proxy value of endorsements just as an indicator, right? Then you have the effect of persuading people. So maybe there's some people who are looking at endorsement and saying, oh, if, you know, Jane Doe supports this candidate, so why? But what Claire identified is really important too, which is candidates can tap into the local politicians network of donors, network of organizers, network of whatever. Yeah. What was the second part of the question? Though? So, well, it, it asserted endorsements don't sway voters, so why slash how do they actually change primaries? Well, okay, so if we, if we don't quibble with the first part um, and you just accept that, then I think you would say, well, they don't really change primaries, but they're still interesting as what I was saying They change before. coverage. They change news coverage or they drive news coverage and they give campaigns a reason to say, oh, today Ted Strickland, the former governor, endorsed us or something like that. Which right. happened with Biden. So media, campaign infrastructure, but also, again, they're just, I think they're a good sort of... Um, barometer. Just barometer, yeah. Also, times are changing a little bit. People are more skeptical of the party apparatus. Parties used to be stronger. Cube and so done. it's probably the case that endorsements used to matter more when kind of the m machine of politics was stronger. You know, we talk about this in Nevada even. Like, mm. you know, a Harry Reid endorsement would likely actually change that the situation in yeah. Nevada. So... Places where the party is stronger and, you know, candidates or rank and file voters are less likely to, um, you know, be opposed to the party apparatus weighing in, you know, it's possible. Weak parties, strong partisanship. Yes. Shout, shout out to Julia Zar. Indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, the silly part of Weston's question was, who would win a Thunderdome battle among the 538 podcast? What are the elements of the Thunderdome battle? I think it's just a free-for-all fight. Is it fight. just a fight? I mean, I don't, I don't want to. Probably, Claire. probably Micah. It would be I think I would. Yeah. Destroy all of you. Who's the tallest? So you're the tallest, then me, then Nate. Mm-hmm. I'm the short. I don't think I'm the shortest. How tall are you? Five ten. Oh, okay. I'm shorter than you are. I'm five nine. <laughs> wow. Um, but I don't think Nate would necessarily play by the rules. I think Nate would fight dirty. Have you ever yeah. seen Nate get mad? Yeah. I think he would fight dirty. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is this part of the podcast. <laughs> Nate's not here. We get to talk about him behind his back on the eve of Christmas Eve. Nate's been think, training, you know. I, th I still think I would win. I got I longer reach. I think you would too. Stronger, smarter, yeah. better looking. <laughs> anyway. I thought I was just... I Let's thought, just get I, out of here. I, I, I think Micah was, can handle this on his own. <laughs> I thought yeah, I could slip that in before you moved on to the next question. All right. Next question. What emerging voter blocks present the greatest opportunity for Democrats to gain an electoral college advantage? I got I, two. Georgia and Arizona. Well, I, I think it, Weston. That's, that's Henry. Henry. I think black voters because um, there are actually quite a lot of black voters in, let's say, southern states yeah. that don't have a very, that community tends to not have a high turnout in those places. Um, and actually, Midwest states too. Yeah, black vo black voters are are to to put it in really mathy terms, more efficiently distributed throughout the states relative to, to the electoral college than like Hispanic voters, for example, who are clustered in Texas and and California. Like even in like, even in like super white states like Iowa, um, there are still cities that have cities on the eastern part of the state that have quite high black populations, right? Um, in part because of like the way that people, that black people migrated from the South during the Great Migration. They would go to like these industrial cities and there are still industrial, there are still, you know, second tier cities in, in red states that have a lot of minorities. The other one, um, which you've written about Claire, I think is non-college educated women, uh, mm -hmm. who again are, are, are 
efficiently distributed, or they're sort of proportionally distributed throughout the Electoral College, um, and went for Trump in 2016, showed signs of moving towards Democrats in 2018. Right. And if Democrats can make, keep and make those gains in 2020, that would pay off big time in the Electoral College. Definitely. Okay, but what about, I mean, it seems like we talk a lot about how if the Rust Belt or Blue Wall of the Midwest isn't going to hold, then the Sun Belt is the alternative for Democrats. And that's like Florida, Texas, Arizona, Georgia. Wouldn't that lead you to believe that, and especially with growing populations, that Hispanics could supersede like other demographics as key to Democrats' electoral college victory if they're not going to be winning in it's the more, Rust Belt states? It's more of a leg up. I, th I mean, yes, by numbers, but it's eventually. A li it's a, eventually, it's a little more of a leg up. There's there's a thing about typically voting gets better if you're a second generation person, right? So there's obviously a lot of first generation. Uh, people in the Latino community who might not be eligible to vote yet, whatever it is. You may be you're, you're waiting to get like citizenship or whatever it is. I also think that there is a, the black community is more like looped into establishment party politics than the Hispanic, the Latino community is right now, in part because I think there's like language barriers that party apparatus haven't really gotten up to snuff with. There's not the same type of outreach to Latino communities, I mean, I think if a, if a Democratic candidate, for instance, knows that they want to appeal to the black community, what do they do? They go to black churches and they go to historically black colleges and universities. And that's kind of like, oh, those are, that's, my, that's my tour of uh, winning black votes. And there's, it's, it's more of a, I think they, they are, it's a less intuitive thing to, to go into Latin, Latino communities for them because they're like, well, where, who should I go to? Where are the, it's just because it's like less familiar to, to party operatives. And as we've talked and written about, the Hispanic community contains multitudes, yep. to borrow your phrase from earlier. So it's it sort of, the, in past Democratic primaries, for example, there hasn't been a, a sort of like Hispanic cohesiveness in terms of who they vote for in, in the way that there has for, for black voters. The other thing is, you know, we think of black voters and Hispanic voters as both Democratic leaning groups. But black voters lean Democratic like 95 to 5. Hispanic voters lean Democratic like 70 to 30. That's a big difference. Um, That's why Texas Republicans were always so right. interested in the like Tejano vote, right? Like they wanted to be, they, they realized that they were, they tended to be, you know, Catholic, especially in, in North America. I think, I mean, in the United States, a lot of like Latinos are also getting involved in the evangelical churches. So there is more of like that tilt of, culturally conservative. But the blue wall, I mean, first of all, the blue wall never really existed, right? If Democrats do continue to lose ground in those Midwestern states, you're right, Galen, that they will have to make that up somewhere. And those Sun Belt states are the obvious opportunity. It's just that it still does seem like, like we're a little bit, we're a little ways off from those states truly flipping, maybe not decades but but a few elections i think also florida kind of threw a wrench in that plan right like everything yeah. made sense for how things were trending except for how poorly democrats did in florida in 2018 where if this trend of you know they're going to just keep doing really well in sunbelt states and can switch strategies you would have expected them to do better in florida and they didn't all right <laughs> next question i'd love to see everyone make hot take predictions for who would be the vp picks of the top four candidates so let's go through the first, the four, top okay, four. Okay, so Biden, Warren, Sanders, Buttigieg. Biden, Harris, or Stacey Abrams? I would lean towards Stacey Abrams because she's um, younger, she's black, and she's from a state that is more geographically desirable for the Democrats. Sanders? Who would be Sanders' VP pick? That's an interesting one, actually. I think it, it would probably have to be Stacey Abrams or... Or Kamala Harris. Yeah, to be just, honest with is you. this just a Stacey Abrams VP hot take? Well, it's these these old she white said it. guys. She said it that she wants to. No, that she's. But but also the old white guys, are, if they win the nomination, are are going to need to have a diverse ticket in some along some dimension. You know? Okay. In that situation, also Stacey Abrams politics probably align better with Bernie Sanders as than politics Harris. than Kamala Harris's. Oh well, I don't know. She's she's a, she's a pragmatist. I don't, I, she's not super left-leaning. Although I guess maybe she has less of 
the prosecutor baggage that Harris has that would turn off Sanders supporters, but maybe I you need that probably... kind of cross play in order to appeal to other parts of the party in your VP pick. Yeah, the other thing I think is interesting is like, Harris and Sanders are also Senate colleagues, so there might be more of like a rapport. Yeah. I mean, this was a big thing when, um, when Romney and Ryan were like VP dating, all the stories were like, oh, um, Paul Ryan is just like one of Mitt Romney's sons. He's like, and it was basically like he's tall and handsome yeah. and therefore they get along <laughs> and they like, they like like policy. So I also think it does come down somewhat to like personal dynamics. Should we do Warren? Warren. Warren. Warren's interesting because she's already a woman. <laughs> Spoiler. She's already. <laughs> Surprise. She's already a woman. She's crossed that, you know. Um, There's Gillum. Booker. She, uh, she likes Booker, supposedly. I think Booker would be yeah. Booker Julian Castro, Julian Castro was already mentioned, um, or has been mentioned. There's Andrew Gillum, although I don't know that you want somebody who Julian Castro kind of Julian Castro kind of sounds right. He'd be a good pick. You know what I'm a big fan of though, in theory, or I just want to see it happen. Like in 2016, I thought it would be exciting if Hillary Clinton picked Warren as her VP. I'm a I'm. There's always this tendency, we just did it, to be like, you have to balance out to the balance demographics. The ticket. Yeah. I'm thinking of, there's an episode of Veep where they're going through like <laughs> yes. who, she should, who she should pick for her VP and someone says, a woman, and she was like, are you kidding me? Another she goes, woman? She goes, no, um, oh. Americans work hard for their money. They don't need that kind of bullshit. <laughs> that show is so good. Um, uh, but Julia Louis-Dreyfus, I mean, come on our show. Oh, oh my God! That yes. would be a dream country. She should be a VP nominee. No, do you really need to balance the ticket? Though? Oprah, Julia Louise Dreyfus. Oprah's the top of the ticket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I we haven't Oprah's done Buddha Judge yet. All right, Buddha Judge needs to somebody pick. with experience. Yeah, and not so Harris. Harris sounds Harris. right. Harris. Harris would be yeah. Because he's he's gotten in sort of like tiffs with. Uh, I think they can overcome tiffs. I wouldn't read that much in the tips. Like Biden and Warren who have a, that, yeah. a history, or, or that's like another Or like Biden and Buttigieg. Like, I'm just trying to think of like debate stage stuff. What if Buttigieg like, picked Biden as his VP to the experience mm -hmm. point? I don't think he'd accept. Not a, you don't want Why to would no. Biden want to be VP again? Yeah. If you've watched Veep, you know to, that being the vice president is the worst job in Washington. Oh, I think Biden probably enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, but would you want to be a VP to a 37-year-old? Hell no. Yeah. No. Also, the party would revolt. I mean, like a large portion of the party would revolt against the lack of demographic diversity. Yeah. We're not being very creative. If you're a political operative, tell us who you think the um, the like long shot insidery picks for like a Buttigieg VP or any of them would be. Like, who are like the, who are the names that that people say in DC coffee shops to sound really smart and and clued in? You know, like oh, actually, like here's the dark horse favorite. I, want to know I like Radiohead, and I know who the VP is going to exactly. be. Exactly. All right, moving along, let's do a lightning round version of our listener questions. And the next question comes from Two Times Jayhawk on Twitter. Question is, is there polling data specific to impeachment in the states with vulnerable GOP senators? Collins et al. If so, what does it indicate? There's not much. Um, and in general, I would just sort of impute from national polls what opinion looks like. Nate was saying this on, on the podcast the other day. So Maine is a, is a swing state. It probably mirrors the country pretty closely in terms of, of where impeachment stands. All right, next question is from Anno and Noat Man. People have weird handles on Twitter. Okay. What stories has 538 had a hard time covering in 2019, and how has it responded? Chose not to cover, hired additional people, didn't do great but learned from, would do X next time, etc. It's probably hard to answer this in a lightning round, but we'll try to keep this short if possible. I'll give, I'll give a lightning answer. Um, generally, we have a hard time covering and largely stay away from stories involving foreign policy, so think the North Korea summit, um, stuff like that. I think we ha it's been a little tricky to cover two areas that we're trying to, to staff up on to, to better cover, which is the intersection of tech and politics, which we haven't done a ton on, Claire has written some on. Um, and in general, what I'd say, race is such a big part of politics now that I think we've 
struggled to make it a proportional part of our coverage. All right, moving on. Our next question is from Darren. To what extent do you think 538's data analytically driven approach has impacted the media slash society broadly? Is it mostly a data wonk echo chamber? No, I take personal offense matter? to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, I think uh, I'll answer this because I wasn't here until basically 2016 and, and Micah and Nate have been doing this for a lot longer. But I mean, essentially Nate kind of, if not created, helped widely popularize empirical journalism, right? The idea that we should write smarter and better about politics. Because I think, frankly, a lot of Americans for a long time have and continue to accept um, pretty punditry um, as a replacement for actual reporting and data about um, politics, which is a way for us to measure our um, cultural metabolism, its history on the quick, whatever you want to say. Um, so I think we've been pretty influential. I mean, you'll see the upshot at the New York Times. I think a lot of um, places are better about writing about polling. Um, and I guess I would say to the second part of the question, no, I don't think it's a data uh, echo chamber. We write a lot of stories that are not purely about polls. You should read them. If you're not, you should tell your friends to read them. And if you're a woman, you should read our site. The, 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 the chamber isn't big enough for the business model to work if it were an echo chamber. Also, like, I mean, just to go back, because this, this, this question has hit a button for me. <laughs> um, why should, why should data and analytics only be like for wonks? Yeah. Why shouldn't why shouldn't people accept that in everyday stories? So just to, totally agree. Just a few thoughts. One is to be clear, it's not like five thirty eight or Nate invented data journalism, right? Newspapers for ages have had what like computer assisted reporting teams um, that have done amazing, great investigative work. I think actually news outlets have gotten much better since 538 existed at using data to cover politics and using data generally. I mean, you think of a site like ProPublica yeah. is doing amazing work. How much of that you ascribe to 538? I don't think I it's think that important. I think it would have developed other, otherwise. Exactly, but like, right. it's, you know, we've got like... Maybe, maybe crimes, Nate helped hate, it along. Hate crimes databases. Like, there's lots of stuff that data can be used for and all that jazz. And I think increasingly you see it as part of journalism's master's degrees, for example, at universities and things like that, which I know did not used to be the case. No, and it, 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 it reaches a broad audience now. I mean, we know that from traffic to, to our site, but also like if you watch CNN, if you watch ABC News, if you watch um, news outlets that are targeting everybody, you see our old colleague. They've, hired up, they've hired up 538. They're to bring 538 to the rest our people. of the world. Yeah. All right, motoring along, we have Jake asks, if a candidate were to win the first three early states, can they seriously be stopped still? Depends on the candidate. Yeah, theoretically. I think it's kind of a weird primary because, like, yeah, sure. And that's Biden's strategy, right? Like, that he could potentially lose the first couple states and still win the nomination because he has strength in other states. I think this, I mean, I, when, when we say like, we don't have an idea of who's probably gonna win, like I really mean it because I think there's so much fluidity in the next couple of months and depends on, on like what the media environment is and the, what it's the- wide, It's wide open. If Biden won the first three states, I think it would be close to wrapped up just because he's so, so strong and has with non-white voters and has such a diverse coalition. But if like Warren or Sanders win the first few states, keep in mind, after the first three states, we still haven't had a contest with a, with a significant population of black voters. So I think depending on who, who won, it would still be wide open. All right, next question. Ooh, another question from another Jake. Knowing what we know now about the unintended consequences of the debate qualification slash donor threshold, what would an optimal system look like? And would it have made a difference in the stratification of the race either way? I find it so funny that people are so obsessed with it. Because candidates have like cried wolf so many times as like a strategy for like donations and for, for all the stuff throughout the primary, like, people have made it such a thing, you kind of set some thresholds. There was, at, at, time, at one time, there's 24 people in the field, 25, however yeah. many. 
Um, to me, it's just there's a lot of maybe they should have narrowed them sooner. I don't know. Like we I had this debate about initially th that it was probably responsible to have a wide field. And then now, and then winnow. And maybe they should have winnowed harder. Yeah. Like Harris getting out of the race was both surprising, but in maybe in some ways very healthy. Yeah, I think I actually think the DNC should have like a philosophy that they express to back up their debate criteria. That's um, interesting. So like, for example, I would either go super simple and just say, okay, it's the polls. We're gonna start off at this percent and r slowly ramp it up. The idea there is to be inclusive um, and, then to, and then to winnow. Including polls and donors has always struck me as a little weird because you're sort of like double counting donors because having donors helps you in the polls, obviously. Right. Um, or I could, you know, the DNC could, or the RNC for that matter, could have a more complicated system, maybe that awards points based on the office you've held, um, a whole host of other factors. But I just think they need like an expressed philosophy behind it. Do you know what else they could do? They could just pick the people they want on the debate stage because they're a private party and they don't have to listen to Americans. They could. They Galen, could, but, but like, why? what would the yeah, why? what would the will be to participate? We'll in get into the we'll get into this next year with the primaries project. But I mean, if you talk to a lot of academics who study the design of democratic systems, they'll tell you that parties should have more meaning. They should make more decisions. They should be kind of stronger in the face of their activists and should ensure that the candidates they're running in a primary actually represent their views and are qualified to be president and that they can play that role in winnowing themselves. Academics believe that we should get rid of direct election of U.S. senators. <laughs> no, that, that could actually work if they had it, like if they kind of expressed all that. I think what wouldn't go over well would, would never happen is just like, to, no, to be fair, yeah. I think a lot of academics say that that might be ideal, but think that it would never fly yeah. with the American public. All right, moving on, moving on. Um, nice, short and sweet. Is Joe Biden this year's Mitt Romney? Well, I'm not even sure which way to take that. What does that mean? Maybe. They probably asked Mitt, 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 Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney. Mitt, Mitt, Romney. <laughs> Mitt Romney was a nice man. Mitt, <laughs> Mitt Romney won the nomination. In the sense, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, Mitt Romney won the nomination, but after Mitt Romney won the nomination, quite a lot of people expressed, quite a lot of conservatives expressed like distaste for him, right? That he wasn't the right kind of conservative. And maybe that's what that person means with their question. Like if Joe Biden gets the nomination, there'll be a healthy segment of the party that thinks he's essentially a Republican, which I think is nonsense, but like is, is a feeling that exists that he's super conservative or super whatever it is. Yeah, Joe Biden is pretty freaking liberal. Um, but I think it's it's more like an enthusiasm. You, it's an enthusiasm yeah. for your nominee kind of thing. Eh, potentially. It, it, it could be some of that. Potentially, sure. yeah, people will be slightly unenthusiastic for Joe Biden. All right, here we go. Next question from Taylor. After the 2016 debacle and with Trump seemingly doubling down on his focus of winning states strategically without concern for garnering support in states he's likely to lose, is it possible to realistically estimate estimate the largest popular vote deficit that might be imaginable with the candidate still winning the Electoral College? I think we've actually done this analysis before. Um, typically, so the Electoral College right now has a kind of GOP leaning bias and Democrats, you know, all this is like on average. Um, Democrats, generally speaking, need to win the popular vote by three points or more to be more confident that they'll win the Electoral College, put it that way. Um, but if like the vote broke in like a very particular way, you could, you could imagine Democrats winning the popular vote by five, six points, maybe a little more and still losing the Electoral College, I think. I mean, because it's almost in some of the states that Democrats are bound to win, the how high they could run up their vote is almost endless, right? That's in California thing. and New York and kind of places like that, they could right. just they get could. crazy margins and it wouldn't make a difference. Yeah, and then imagine, you know, GOP turnout is like depressed in the super red states and it all comes down to, to the Midwest. Yeah, it could be. Imagine, imagine if the Democrat wins by six points in 2020 and Trump wins the Electoral College. We'll see. 
All right, next question. Okay, this will be a fun one to end on. What actor slash actress would you cast as yourself in 538 the movie? Oh, <laughs> God. That is a great question. Should we do each other's? Or yes. Do you, okay. We'll start with Micah. We can Jake pick. Gyllenhaal. Oh, that is so nice of Claire. Thank you. That is very nice. Similar looks, but I also, but also like, um, could maybe play some of your your quiet angst sometimes. Um, I think it needs like both. The, it, need, it needs a quiet performance. Can I tell you something without you giving me shit, just because it's amazing coincidence? Sometimes I wear on the streets of New York. Um, a, <laughs> I said that word. A baseball cap and sunglasses, and I sort of pretend to be a celebrity in oh my, my own God. head, right? That's so ridiculous. Um, That's the most embarrassing thing. It's, it's fun okay. to do it. Just, it. Try it once. It's very fun to do. Um, that just as a mental game. Um, and one time, um, two young women came up to me and asked for my autograph and thought I was Jake Gyllenhaal. Whoa! I did Whoa. not know that story. Remember, in this story, 95% of my face is covered. <laughs> So I don't know if that backs up what you're saying, but um, if anyone from CAA is listening, uh, I have Lord. someone for you. I don't. This is maybe not original enough. Okay, Claire Foy. Because she's named Claire. I don't know. I don't no, even know who that I, is. In fact, I immediately went to the person who plays the Queen before I remembered that her name was Claire. Oh, okay. How do you spell her last name? And then name? I thought, F O I. F O Y. F O Y. F O Y. I love yeah. the Queen. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see that. She's British, though. I mean, but the most talented actors can play That's Americans, true. Most even of, if they're most British. Most British people are playing Americans on television yeah. nowadays. <laughs> very few. Um, there are actually very few American actors. They're mostly British. Galen. Galen's kind of the hard one. Yeah. I don't know that many uh, that many actors, to be honest. <laughs> That's predictable. <laughs> yeah. Funny. Yeah. Um, it has to be someone younger. Timothy Chalamet in a, in a blonde wig. You know, <laughs> <laughs> wait, I don't know who that is either. No, know. he's too. He's a little too young. Who's the guy from Miles something? He was in that movie about drumming. He doesn't look like you. Miles just, Teller. Yeah, Miles Teller's a good actor. I could see Miles Teller if if he lost a little weight. Honestly, would would look yeah. a little more like you. Do you do you get one any? Do you, do you have like a? No. When I was in middle school, people told me I looked like Al Gore. <laughs> a young, what does a young, I, I think young Al Gore was hot. <laughs> I've also got to have that conversation once. Or was it like a young John Probably, Kay? probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay, who could, who could perform Gail and Claire, me, and Nate? And Nate is a Who do we one. even could play oh, Nate? No, I think I know who, sh who should play Nate. <laughs> Who's the guy who played Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, he could do it. All right, well, let's leave things there. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, Galen. Happy holidays. Yeah, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Thank you, Micah. And, and women. Thank you, both of you. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy so holidays. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas to everybody at home. Happy Kwanzaa. If anybody's celebrating anything else, uh, enjoy that holiday <laughs> as well. Happy Boxing Day. And also, before we go, we should mention we have a live show coming up in DC on January 16th. For anybody who's interested in seeing 538 live, more of us in person in our actual, you know, physical representations, uh, 538.com slash live. Anyway, too much eggnog at this point. Happy holidays. My name is Galen Drew, Tony Chow, and Anna Rothschild are in the control room. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcasts at 538.com, or of course, you can tweet at us. If you like the show, go give us a rating or review on the Apple Podcast Store. Or tell someone about us when you're around your family over the holidays. Tell them to check out the 538 Politics podcast. We're going to have plenty in store for you over the coming year. Anyway, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>